Ok. Um, bom dia a todos. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, um, welcome to this uh, first invited talk today. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce you, our speaker today, Dr. Jeffrey Dean from, from Google. Jeff, uh, as he is most known by the community, is a senior fellow in Google's research group, where he is currently leads the Google Brain uh, project. Jeff received a PhD in computer science from the University of Washington in 1996. And after um, some time, some short period at the <laughs> DEC Research Center in, in California uh, in, in 1996, and uh, he, went, he went to Google, he moved to Google in 1999, where he is now, um, um, sorry, I, I'm, I lost my, um, he now is a, a research fellow at the, the working in Palo Alto. Um, since, uh, since then, he's, uh, he's been working let me see, I, I can see. <laughs> Sorry about that, it's better. Since then, he's been involved with almost every piece of technology deployed by Google, including five generators of his search engine and several other products, such as Google AdSense, Google News, the Big Tape Storage System, and more recent Google Translate, for which he has designed and implemented a system for distributed high-speed access to very large language models. In other words, almost every uh, Google application that we use today has been designed and implemented by Jeff and his group. Thus, in his talk today, Jeff will give us his view of how deep learning can be used in many applications, particularly in scientific and engineering applications. Thank you, Jeff, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So, uh, oh. thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. This is my first time in Brazil. I have now been here for three hours. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm going to give you a talk uh, that is in several parts. But the first thing I want to point out is that many of the pieces of work in this talk are joint work with many, many people at Google. So this is not solely my work. Um, what I hope to do in this talk is to convey three things. Four things, really. Um, first, that the application of machine learning is really having a tremendous impact on the world in many, many ways. And I'd like to illustrate some of those ways. Second, that if we can make software tools that make it easier to express machine learning ideas and research uh, concepts, we'll be able to make even faster progress. Third, that machine learning is actually fundamentally changing the way we build computers. And I'll tell you about some of the work that we're doing there. And hopefully, the, those three will convince you about the fourth thing, which is that if we continue to do great machine learning research, build better software and better hardware, that will lead to even more advances in many fields. So um, first, let me take you through the explosion that is the current machine learning research community. Um, this is a graph showing uh, Archive as a pr paper preprint hosting service. And if you look at the uh, sort of subcategories on that service, where papers uh, that are in the topic of machine learning go, you see this tremendous growth over the last sort of seven or eight years of how many papers are being published in there. There's just a tremendous influx of people into this field looking at what kinds of things uh, are interesting from the perspective of applying machine learning to different problems, from the perspective of fundamental new algorithms. And the rate of growth of papers on archive is faster than what we used to get in computer hardware improvement of the Moore's Law improvement of doubling every couple of years. Um, so that's a lot of new kinds of work and ideas coming into this community. Um, one of the most successful sub-areas of machine learning in the last few years is actually not, a not a necessarily a new area. It's actually some older ideas that have suddenly gained popularity because we now have enough computation to tackle very large, real-scale problems. Um, so there are, deep learning, if you may have heard this term, is essentially um, 
this modern reincarnation of, of artificial neural networks, which were invented in the 70s and 80s and were popular in the late 80s as a way to tackle sort of uh, various kinds of pattern recognition problems. And in, I, I actually did an undergraduate thesis uh, in 1990 on parallel training of neural networks because I felt like the abstraction was a good one and we just needed more computation. And if I could get the department's you know, 64 processor machine to train neural networks, we could do great things. Um, it turns out we needed a million times more computation, not 64 times. Uh, but now we have that, thanks to Moore's Law. And there's really been tremendous advances, um, even though we're sort of building on the algorithmic frameworks that were developed in you know, the 70s and 80s for a lot of these techniques. So the key benefit of neural networks is that they can learn from very raw forms of data that can be noisy, heterogeneous. So you can do things like train a model to take in the raw pixels of an image and then learn to predict things about that image purely by observing different training examples. You know, you, you show the model an image and you say, that's a cat. Here's another image, that's a fire truck. Here's another image, that's a leopard. And by observing many, many examples, you actually, ha the model can actually learn to distinguish new kinds of images. It can actually make correct decisions and generalize to new images, which is the ultimate goal. You don't want to just memorize the training data, but be able to take those uh, patterns and learn to apply them to new problems. Um, so they're essentially learning very, very complicated functions and from inputs to outputs but they're not kind of the mathematical functions you might kind of have intuition about. Instead, they're very complicated functions that are things like very perceptual problems. Like you take in an image like that and you can predict a label like that's a huss or monkey. You know, that's a problem that even humans are not that great at unless they've studied many different kinds of monkeys. You could probably say monkey, but not necessarily that kind of monkey. Um, you can take in audio waveforms uh, as a time sequence and then make a prediction of a transcript of what was being said. How cold is it outside? That's speech recognition. And you can do that in a completely end-to-end -end manner using a neural network. You can take in language one word at a time in one language and produce a translated version. Hello, how are you? And the output would be bonjour, comment allez-vous? You can even do more interesting things than just predict a label for, a, for an image. You can actually generate an entire sentence that describes that image purely by training on images with sentences that humans have written about those images. And that actually shows a pretty reasonable level of understanding of what's going on in that image, right? A blue and yellow train traveling down the tracks. It has to know that that train is blue and yellow, that there's tracks, that it's on top of them, and uh, so, you know, if you'd asked me four or five years ago if, if computers could do that anytime soon, I would have said, I don't think so. And actually, we can do that now. And uh, we're making great progress across a number of these different areas. So that's pretty exciting. Um, just to give you an example of how much improvement there's been in the last few years, uh, Stanford University runs a contest every year for computer vision where the goal is to take in a color image and produce one of a thousand different labels, like to predict is that a huss or monkey or a fire truck or a, 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 you know, 40 different kinds of dogs. Um, and the winning entry in 2011 did not use a deep neural network. It used other sort of uh, kinds of hand-engineered computer vision features. And the winner that year got 26% error, right? So if you get 26% error on a computer vision contest, your, your vision is kind of like that. Um, and one of, the, one of the graduate students who administers the contest decided a year ago that he would try to understand what human performance on this task would be. And so he actually subjected himself to a, uh, a fairly sort of disciplined machine learning-like training regimen where he sat himself down for 100 hours with you know, thousands of training images. And then he like, set those aside. And then on the test images, he tried to see how well he did. And he got about 5% error. Right? So this is actually a pretty hard task because you have to distinguish lots of kinds of dogs and, and not everyone is, is great at that. Uh, he actually improved a lot. Another lab mate of his that only did a few hours of training instead of 100 hours got 12% error. Right? Um, and so in 2016, the winner got 3% error. The, compu the best computer algorithm got 3% error. 
So we've gone in five years from 26% error down to 3% error. And this is really transformative, right? Computers couldn't see, now they can see. And that's a really big deal, right? If you think back to the time in evolutionary biology when animals evolved eyes, that's sort of where we are in computing now. So, um, to show you some ways in which machine learning can impact the world, I thought I would use this list. So the US National Academy of Engineering, uh, sort of a, a sibling organization to this, this one, um, in 2008 decided they would put together a, a committee of distinguished engineers and put together a list of what they thought were the most important problems to work on in the 21st century. And so they came up with this list of 14, 14 problems. It's a very good list. If we solved all those, you know, people would be happier, healthier, the planet would be better. Um, so it's a good list, I like it. Um, and the thing I'm gonna illustrate in the rest of the talk is that machine learning is really gonna impact many of these areas. I think actually all of them in small ways, bigger ways, or very major ways. And I'm gonna use the ones in red to illustrate how machine learning is gonna have an impact. But I think even the ones in black, it will have an impact. I just don't have time in the talk. Okay, so one of them is restore and improve urban infrastructure. Uh, and what better way to do that than with autonomous cars? And autonomous cars actually will really dramatically change the way we design cities and how we sort of operate in urban environments. You know, if you really had uh, widespread deployment of autonomous cars, you wouldn't need parking lots. You would have a very different kind of setup of the infrastructure itself. Um, and we're actually getting pretty close uh, to autonomous cars actually being a real thing. Um, many, many companies are working on this. Waymo is Alphabet's, our Google uh, subsidiary that focuses on self-driving cars. And to give you an example of how close we are in, in Waymo, um, in January, we've been running tests in Phoenix, Arizona, in the United States. Uh, and in January, we did a test with 100 cars with no safety drivers in the seats to take over. Most of our tests so, to date have been, you know, with a safety driver that we employ to take over in case there's some problem. And we were confident enough in Arizona to do tests with uh, 100 cars with passengers in the back seat, but no driver in the front seat. So that's, you know, not decades away. That's getting pretty close. Now, admittedly, Arizona, if you know your US geography, is a particularly friendly environment for self-driving cars. It, it tends to have a bunch of retired people, so the, the uh, other cars are pretty slow. Um, the, the weather is very good. It's very sunny. It never rains. Uh, it's very, very hot, so there are no pedestrians because they don't walk anywhere. <laughs> but still. If you can do it in Phoenix, it's baby steps to get to more challenging environments like downtown Manhattan or San Francisco. But, you know, it's close, which is pretty exciting. Um, another area that's kind of related to urban infrastructure is the field of robotics. And uh, we've been doing a bunch of work on uh, robotic learning. Essentially, now that computers can see, you can obviously now extend that to using vision and perception in the control path and ha essentially learn hand coding robotic control algorithms. And so this is a lab we set up to explore the idea of having many robots learn to do things and pool their experience so that they get better and better collectively. And I think I need to press. And so you can see, uh, we, we call this the arm farm, although I liked the arm pit. I was overruled. Um, and so you can see they're just trying to grasp things. And the nice thing about grasping as a task is uh, like a small child trying to learn how to pick up different things, you can actually tell if you succeeded or failed yourself. So if I try to pick this up and I close my gripper all the way, I failed. And if I do, the, do it like that, I succeeded. And so you can actually self-supervise your learning process. You can see whether you succeeded or failed, and then you can collect all the sensor data and the decisions you made and use that to then um, train a better model for the next day's work. And so every day, these model, these robots get better at doing this. And over time, we've done about 800,000 grasps in a few weeks. 
and the biggest grasping data sets prior to that were about 20,000 grasps. And so with more data, you just get better at grasping different kinds of objects. We actually just ordered a bunch of uh, variety packs of tools and toys on Amazon and dumped them into bins. Another area of robotics we've been uh, working on is trying to have robots learn from human demonstrations. Uh, this is one of our uh, interns. Um, we, we, we let them do other things too. <laughs> um, but uh, what we're trying to do is take a video and then from the raw pixels of the video, learn to do different activities. And so here you see the robot kind of doing various motions to mimic the hand gestures and the, the sort of torso movements. Here you see it actually learning to pour. And the really nice thing is actually pouring is a pretty complicated activity for a robot. You know, if you had to hand code what the pouring sort of uh, process is, it's a very complicated thing to learn and to describe to a robot in a hand coded control system. But by getting a few videos of people pouring things, I think we had about uh, three minutes of video of diff different people pouring from different angles. Um, and then we ran nine iterations of a learning algorithm, and you can see it getting better over time. So that's, that's pretty good. That's like, I'll call that four-year-old level, <laughs> not eight-year-old. Um, and uh, that, that learning process took about 15 minutes. And so that's really a sign that, you know, you can teach robots new skills with this, instead of hand coding things, you just demonstrate something. And that's gonna be pretty transformative for getting robots to do many things. I think you can have a library of hundreds of skills and then show the robot how to stitch those skills together to do more complex things. Okay, um, another area where I think machine learning is gonna have this tremendous impact in the world is in advancing health informatics, basically making people healthier. And in, in prep for this talk, I wanted to learn about how healthcare is done in Brazil, and I loaded up the Wikipedia page, and I read that healthcare in Brazil is a constitutional right, which is actually a really great thing. I wish more countries had this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's clearly a really important thing, so important that some countries uh, give universal health care to all their citizens. Um, so we've been working in a bunch of different problems in the medical domain because we think and see opportunities for machine learning to really augment what, what uh, doctors and, and other health care providers can bring to treating patients. Uh, one of the first that we started working in was the, a disease called diabetic retinopathy. So this is a, a symptom, uh, uh, um, if, you're a, if you have diabetes, you're at high risk for uh, developing diabetic retinopathy. Many, many people throughout the world, about 400 million people are at risk of this and really should get screened every year. And the way you get screened is someone, you go into the doctor, eye doctor, they take a retinal image like that, and then an ophthalmologist looks at that image and assesses, are you, do they see symptoms of, of diabetic retinopathy? And if they do, it's very treatable. So if this is caught in time, it's not a problem. But if it's not caught in time, uh, you can suffer vision loss. And in India, there's a very large shortage of eye doctors. There's a big uh, population that's at risk for this disease. And there just aren't enough ophthalmologists to assess you know, these, op these retinal images. And 40, so 45% of patients actually suffer vision loss before being diagnosed with this. And to diagnose this, an ophthalmologist kind of looks at these images and then grades it on a five-point scale, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and they're looking for like these subtle kind of hemorrhages in the retinal image. Um, so one issue is doctors' opinions can vary a lot. And uh, to illustrate this, um, the rows here are different patient images. And the columns here are different ophthalmologists looking at that same image, making an assessment of that grade, one, two, three, four, or five. Um, so slightly terrifying is the stat that if you ask two ophthalmologists to grade the same image, they agree on that number 60% of the time. But perhaps more terrifying is that if you say, show the same ophthalmologist the same image a few hours later, they agree with themselves 65% of the time. Um, and you know, it's really a subjective process. It's sort of how dark do I think those spots are? Is that a two or a three? Um, 
So to get a good labeled data set for training a machine learning model to do this task, we actually got every image graded by seven ophthalmologists. And then we could average and, you know, if it's five twos and two threes, it's probably more like a two. Um, but once you have that, uh, you can then feed it into a traditional computer vision algorithm, but now just trained on retinal images. So this is the same kind of image that was predicting, is that a monkey or a whatever, uh, just trained on, on uh, retinal data, and it can make those kinds of predictions. And if you do that, uh, this is an article our group published in uh, JAMA at the end of 2016, where we showed that basically we were on par, perhaps slightly better than a board certified ophthalmologist at assessing uh, this, this uh, disease. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do was to do better than that though, because uh, you saw the intra greater uh, agreement. And so in the last year or so, we've been making a lot of improvements. And one of the improvements we made was we decided we would change how we labeled our training data. So instead of having seven board certified ophthalmologists grade the image, we would instead get retinal specialists together, which is sort of a higher standard of, of, of specialty in this particular thing. Um, and we would actually get three of them in a room to argue about each image and decide. And so it was called an adjudicated uh, protocol. And so with an adjudicated protocol by retinal specialists, we now have a model that is as good as retinal specialists, which is a higher standard of care, and that's what you want. Um, and that was published in the ophthalmology journal uh, recently. But a pretty cool thing. So this task is essentially one that ophthalmologists can do and we can do as well or better. Uh, but I will now tell you a tale of scientific discovery. Um, so we had a new person join the ophthalmology machine learning group and Lily Peng, the person who heads that group, um, said, oh, to get you familiar with our software and how to run things, why don't you take these retinal images and go see if you can predict age and gender from them? Uh, because we had some data where we had the images and we also knew the patient's age and, and gender, um, or biological sex, I should say. Um, and so uh, the person went, and Lily thought the per they would be able to predict age within a couple of decades and uh, gender they wouldn't be able to predict it all, so the AUC should be 0.5, no better than chance. And so the person went away and a few days later came back and said, uh, I can predict gender with an AUC of 0.7. And Lily said, uh, that, that seems weird. Uh, go check everything and come back later. And so the person came back and said, I can predict gender with 0.85 now. <laughs> uh, and so that really woke people up because um, certainly age, uh, and gender are, are things that are correlated with cardiovascular risk. And so they started to look at what other things they could predict that are related to cardiovascular risk. And I should point out that gender, ophthalmologists didn't think you could actually predict gender from a retinal image. It's not something ophthalmologists know how to do. Um, and so predicting your hemoglobin level and some other things uh, actually also are, are symptomatic of cardiovascular risk. And so we now have a new biomarker a new thing you can do with a retinal image that we didn't know you could do before, which is predict cardiovascular risk to the level of accuracy of what would normally require a blood test and a, a blood draw and then a lab test. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. We now have something new developed from very subtle things that we didn't even know existed in the retinal images. Um, so similar techniques are also working in other medical imaging domains. I won't spend too much time on this, but essentially you can train a, a model to do uh, sort of um, tumor identification, tum tumor localization in, uh, say, in this particular thing, it's uh, uh, breast cancer uh, biopsies and cells. Uh, or, um, and in much of the world, pathology is still done with sort of traditional optical microscopes. So one of the things, if this is digitized and you're in a digital pathology, which sort of um, uh, advanced healthcare systems sometimes have these like large digital viewers, uh, but many, many parts of the world, you still use uh, optical microscopes for this sort of work. And so one of the things we wanted to do was see if we could build a prototype that would allow us to insert a little bit of uh, uh, sort of equipment in the optical pathway of the microscope and then get the same model to give an augmented reality microscope where you can actually overlay information that you're looking at uh, of over top of the raw sort of uh, optical information you're looking at in the microscope. 
And so the way this works is we have a mirror that can kind of capture things and send it to a set of sensors. We can then digitize that, run the model through uh, the something that uh, essentially localizes tumors, and then feed the uh, overlaid uh, you know outline of where the tumors are back into the optical pathway with another mirror. Um, and so we have a prototype that we demonstrated of that uh, last month, and uh, people seem pretty excited about this. We think this could actually you know really aid pathologists because really when you're looking at one of these slides you're really looking for a needle in a haystack, right? You're scanning over this giant cell image trying to find the smallest little thing that might be tumorous. Um, and it's very easy to miss things. Okay, uh, the other thing we're pretty excited about is the use of um, machine learning for sort of predictive uh, tasks in healthcare. Can we, essentially, one of the things doctors wanna do, essentially, is for a patient, you wanna predict the future and then use that information to uh, affect what kind of care and what kind of treatment and diagnoses you make. Um, and so deep learning methods for sequential prediction are actually becoming very good at a variety of different tasks. And so I will take a brief detour through translation, uh, uh, sort of human language translation, and then we'll, we'll do translational medicine and see how that affects healthcare. Um, so our group has been working on sequential prediction tasks for a little while. And so in the end of 2014, uh, three people in our group published this paper called Sequence to Sequence Learning with Neural Networks. Essentially, the idea here is you have a model that takes in a sequence and conditioned on that sequence predicts a different sequence. And if you frame, if you think about language translation right, you can take in an English sentence and then conditioned on that sentence predict, say, the Portuguese uh, equivalent of that sentence. Um, and that's really the essence of translation it's the essence of uh, other Google product releases since then. Like we now have a feature where you can take in an email and predict what responses the user might want to give to that email. And that's essentially using this kind of model. Um, so in translation, this turns out to be a very end-to-end -end mechanism for doing translation. Uh, the old translation system was a very complicated set of statistical models of various sub-pieces of the translation problem and was about 500,000 lines of code that had developed over a decade. That's that blue line there. And what we're seeing here is for different language pairs, the quality of translations produced by those systems assessed by humans on a six point scale. And so the blue is the old system, 500,000 lines of code. The green is this new neural based deep learning translation system trained end to end just on lots of data. It's very simple to express. Like the mathematics are actually so simple that it's 500 lines of code to express this model. And the quality is much, much better if you train it on enough data. And so the, that's the green line there. And the yellow line is the quality of translations produced by bilingual humans as judged by other humans. And so you can see for some language pairs, we're actually approaching that level of quality, um, which is pretty exciting because big improvements in translation quality are really helpful for understanding text that's not in your native language. Um, I'm sure we've all seen bad translations, bad algorithmic translations that you can't make any sense of what's going on. Okay, so now if we view me medical records and line up all the events in a medical record on a sequence, like in a time-ordered sequence, you can view the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model as if you take a prefix trying to predict the suffix, right? So given all the information you know about a patient so far, can you predict the rest of what's gonna happen to them? Uh, and you can train on existing medical records, right? So if I look at a patient with 10 years of history and I take seven years of their history and I try to predict the next three years, that's how I can train these models. Um, and then you can answer, use that model to answer a variety of questions. Uh, you know, what are the most likely diagnoses for this patient? What kind of medications should you consider prescribing? Is this patient likely to develop diabetes in the next uh, 12 months? These kinds of things. And uh, it turns out this works pretty well because we're actually able to use all the data in the medical record to make these sorts of predictions. And so this is a paper that just uh, appeared yesterday in Nature Digital, Digital Medicine, which is a new journal uh, from the Nature Group. Um, with a lot of co-authors, we have collaborators in several different healthcare institutions, and we've been working with de-identified medical records uh, from these different institutions, and the paper has a bunch more comparisons, but I'll talk you through one of the things that we're able to do. 
So on the right-hand side, we're trying to predict uh, patient mortality risk, um, which is really an important thing of how much attention does this patient need? How likely are they to, to uh, you know, need medical attention more than another patient? And so the dotted line there is the current clinical baseline, which uses a handful of different kind of predictive numbers and allows you to get to a certain level of accuracy. And we're showing different times at when these predictions can be made, like when the person is admitted to the hospital, before they're admitted, or after. And what you see is that this, uh, the deep learning method uh, that uses all the data in the medical record and is the solid line at the top there. And that essentially allows us to get 24 hours earlier notice for the same level of accuracy of mortality risk. And so that really gives you 24 hours head start on which patients really need your attention. And that allows you to do interventions sooner to really uh, take your time to assess uh, those patients that are mo at most serious risk. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, Another one of the grand challenges was engineer better medicines, and that's about drug discovery. But actually, many of them are related to basically understanding chemical or material properties better. And so I'll take you through one piece of work we've done in this space. Um, and essentially, one thing that quantum chemists want to do is to predict properties of molecules. So you have some mole molecular configuration, and you want to now predict various aspects of, of that configuration. Does it bind with something else? Uh, what are its quantum properties, things like that. And the way you traditionally do this is in a computer simulation with something called the density functional theory simulation, um, which is a very computationally intensive thing. So it takes about an hour to give you an answer for one of these molecular configurations. Uh, it turns out you can actually use that simulator as a teacher for a, a machine learning model. And so the way you do that is you take the input and the output that the real simulator would give you and you now say, well, that's my training data for my neural net. And so you can now uh, use that same thing. And the end result is you can't distinguish the accuracy of the neural net versus the original simulator, but it's 300,000 times faster, right? And that's a pretty transformative kind of thing if one of your tools speeds up by a factor of 300,000, because now you use it in a completely different way, right? You could imagine screening 100 million molecules in the afternoon and picking the 1,000 that seem interesting in some way and then investigating those in more detail, whereas that was completely infeasible before. OK, uh, reverse engineer the brain was another one. So let's go through that. Uh, there's another part of Google research that is doing work in this area. And the idea is one part of understanding the brain is just understanding how the neurons in the brain are connected together let alone the dynamic properties of it, we don't even actually really understand how the neurons themselves are wired together. Um, so there's a field of neuroscience called connectomics where you're actually trying to reverse engineer the, the connectivity structure of neurons in, in real brains. And the way you do that is you take some brain tissue from some organism, be it you know mouse, human, bird, something, you do high resolution electron microscope scans of very thin slices of that brain tissue. And then you have this problem where you're trying to reconstruct what is the connectivity of neurons, but the slices have sort of gotten in the way and you don't necessarily know, does this neuron connect with this part of the next image above it or this part? And so you're trying to essentially follow these kind of uh, mysterious maze-like things through these stacks of electron microscope slides. Um, but if you're able to do that, you can create a really nice picture like that. Or if you're a computer scientist and prefer kind of adjacency matrix representations of graphs, then you would look at it in the bottom right. Uh, but really, we're just trying to figure out what's connected to what. Um, and so the, the group that's working on this has made tremendous progress in the last uh, year and a half or so. They've actually, the metric they use to assess how well they're doing is how far in neural tissue distance can they go before they make a mistake in micrometers. And they've actually improved that by a factor of 1,000. This is a log scale on the left um, in the last 18 months to the point where they can now almost do an entire songbird brain. Actually, they, they can now. This is a slightly old chart. Um, and are working their way towards doing a mouse cortex, uh, which would give us quite a bit of insight into, into a mammal uh, for the first time. Um, and one of the techniques they developed was a new machine learning technique called uh, flood filling networks, which essentially start with a raw image, 
but then make a bunch of predictions and then use the sequence of predictions they've made so far to make the next prediction. So that you sort of follow parts where you're very confident and then as your confidence drops off, then you say, okay, well now I'm more confident over here. So now I'm gonna go over here and sketch things out there for a little while. And this is it following the boundaries of a cell wall in 2D, um, but it really looks cooler in 3D. Uh, and so this is it following these neural branches through these slices of uh, uh, sort of electron microscope scans and tracing out a particular neuron. Um, and you can see it goes along one branch for a while and then it sort of says, well, I'm not confident on that branch anymore and now I'm gonna go on this other branch. Uh, and it produces really nice pictures of, of neurons like that. Um, and to the point where we can now basically do an entire songbird brain, uh, you know, an interesting sized organism and get connectivity information. Uh, yeah, and it's a lot of data for songbird brain. So it's about 600 billion three-dimensional pixels of data that you go through to do the reconstruction for a songbird brain. Okay. Um, so one of the kind of broadest areas in this uh, set of challenges was engineer the tools of scientific discovery. Um, and it's pretty clear if machine learning is gonna be a big component of solving some of these other things that we should engineer tools that help us do machine learning better. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing in our group is developing software tools that allow us to easily express machine learning algorithms. And so the second generation of these that we developed was a system called TensorFlow um, and it's really, uh, we decided we would open source this system so that anyone in the world can use it for whatever they want, for scientific problems like this, for all kinds of things that we never imagined. And it has a, a very flexible Apache 2.0 license, which basically means you can take it and do whatever you want with it, um, which is nice. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but that's basically what it means. Um, and TensorFlow has actually had a pretty good adoption rate. So when we open sourced it, this is, uh, we put the source on GitHub, which is a popular uh, hosting service for uh, open source software. And uh, it immediately had a, a really big surge in interest and has sort of steadily climbed that surge in interest um, and measured in GitHub stars, which is sort of uh, people expressing interest in particular repositories. And this is it compared to a bunch of other sort of open source machine learning uh, toolkits and platforms. Uh, and, you know, it's acquired a bunch of pretty impressive statistics. Uh, I think, you know, one of the really nice things is the broad set of contributors we have. There's about 400 contributors inside Google and about 1,000 outside Google in many companies, in many universities. Uh, university machine learning classes are starting to use this as their curriculum for expressing machine learning concepts and ideas to their students. It's been downloaded 13 million times, you know, Lots, lots, of, lots of exciting community has built up around this and people do, are doing all kinds of things. Um, so just to give you an example of things that people are doing with it that we didn't expect, um, there's a company in the Netherlands that has built uh, essentially fitness sensors for cows. Uh, and if you have a herd of a lot of cows, it's actually hard to tell which of your cows is kind of not feeling so well or is limping or things like that. And they can actually do this with machine learning on the fitness data from the cow. Um, here in Brazil, actually, there's a, a group working with the Tembe tribe, I think, that is using machine learning to detect chainsaw uh, audio signals from a kilometer away, so they can detect illegal deforestation, and then, you know, I summon the authorities, I guess. Uh, and in Tanzania, a group from Penn State and the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture has developed a sort of deep learning based uh, model that actually runs on a mobile phone that farmers can take out to their crops and hold there and that it, it will say your crop is fine or it's diseased and it has this particular disease and this is the way you should treat it. Um, uh, and so cassava is actually the third largest source of carbohydrates in the world. So this is a pretty important uh, problem. Okay, now in the last little bit, I'm gonna take you through a few pieces of work we've been doing and how they fit together at the end. Um, so our group also does uh, sort of core machine learning algorithms research. And one of the things we believe we want to make faster progress and be able to do, tackle more interesting problems is we want much bigger models, much more powerful models that can remember more things about large data sets. Um, 
but we think they need to be sparsely activated. One of the reasons uh, br actual real brains are very energy efficient is they have different centers of expertise and they don't activate them all, all the time, right? If I'm, you know, looking at a garbage truck, my garbage truck part of my brain is on, but my, you know, part that recites Shakespearean poetry is off. Um, and so with that, we sort of want these huge model capacities, but we only want to activate a tiny fraction of the actual model. And so we've developed uh, some work in this area where we have something called a sparsely gated mixture of experts uh, layer. Uh, I will take you through what that actually means. So essentially, the pink uh, cells there are traditional parts of a, of a normal neural network uh, that is fully activated on every example. And what we do is we insert this layer in between those that has different experts. And those experts just start out with random parameters and develop a set, set of expertise over time through specialization during the training process. Uh, and we also learn a gating network that learns to route examples to which expert is most likely to be helpful for this particular kind of data. Um, and each expert has a lot of parameters. So it, think of it as a large matrix of floating point numbers, 2 million by 2 million, or 2,000 by 2,000 maybe. And there are many experts. So this is a very large sparse model. And the trick with the gating network is it's only gonna activate one or two of these experts for any given example. Um, not all 2,000 of them. And after training, you can actually see that these experts do develop different kinds of expertise. So these are the kinds of ex a random sample of the examples routed to these different experts, three randomly chosen experts. And you can see this particular expert on the left is really good at talking about innovation and science and scientists. The one in the center is really good at taking a leading role and playing a leading role in leadership. And, and the one on the right is really good at kind of fast adverby things. Um, and these are, you know, very different kinds of distributions of data. And so they've developed these centers of expertise. And this actually works very well. So if you compare that to the translation model I talked about earlier on the bottom row of this table, um, if we add this set of experts, what you see is several nice properties. So one is the translation quality, which is this blue score measure, improves by one blue point, which is actually a pretty big deal. Um, so higher quality translations. The amount of computation per word actually goes down because we're able to shrink the pink part of the model that is activated on every example, make that smaller. Um, and the training time for this model goes down tremendously by a factor of 10, roughly. Uh, so even though we're getting a more accurate model with less computation per example we're, and trained in one-tenth the time, uh, that, that's sort of the benefits, I guess. Uh, the only downside is you have a large number of parameters because you now have all these other experts that you're, uh, uh, are involved in your model. Okay. Um, another thing I'd like to talk about is bringing the ability to automatically learn to solve new problems to machine learning models. So the current way you solve a machine learning problem is you have data and you have computation, you know, GPU cards or a desktop machine or some cloud-based setup, and you bring in a human machine learning expert and they look at the data and they make a bunch of decisions. Like, oh, it's an image problem, so I'm gonna train this kind of uh, image model. It's gonna have 13 layers and it's gonna have this size filters and I'm gonna use this learning rate and so on. Um, now, one of the big problems in the world is that machine learning experts are in very short supply. And there's a lot of machine learning problems in the world that we could use machine learning for, but we don't have the human expertise to do so. So one of the things we'd like to be able to do is can we turn this into data plus a lot of computation in order to make the kinds of decisions a human machine learning expert would make in solving the problem. And if we could do that, then all of a sudden, instead of you know, 10,000 or 20,000 organizations in the world really using uh, machine learning in production as we are today, you could have 10 million organizations that you know, should be, could be benefiting from machine learning, have more of them be able to do so. Uh, you know, every city in the world should set their stoplight timings by machine learning, but most cities are not hiring machine learning experts to do that. 
And the way this works is we're gonna have a machine learning uh, model generating model. So the model generating model will describe a machine learning model and then we can train that model and see how well it does. And if it does well, great. If it does badly, we got some information that that's not a really good approach to try. And so you're gonna generate a bunch of models, you're gonna train them for a few hours, and then you're gonna use the accuracy or the loss of those generated models as a reinforcement learning signal to push the model generating model in good directions and away from bad directions. Um, and this actually works, so you essentially iterate this many times and you can then find models that work well for your particular problem automatically. And the models it comes up with are kind of strange looking in some cases. Like a human machine learning expert would probably not have quite this organic a set of connections in the model structure. But uh, these models do have that. Um, so one of the nice things is this actually works, uh, which is always good. Um, so this graph shows you a variety of different machine learning computer vision models for the ImageNet challenge I talked about earlier. And the x-axis is the amount of computation those models use for making a prediction about a new image. And generally you see as you use more computation on the x-axis, the accuracy on the y-axis goes up. You know, more compute generally buys you a bit more accuracy. Um, and each one of these black dots here was years of effort by some of the top machine learning and computer vision teams in the world. You know, they're all submitting to this contest. Each one, when it was published, advanced the state of the art in some way. And so if you turn our AutoML approach loose on this problem, uh, you actually do better. And you do better both at the high end where you care most about accuracy and uh, are willing to pay a very high computational cost, and you also do better at the low end where you want something very lightweight that can run on a mobile phone or something like that, and you want the most accurate thing possible in some fixed compute budget. So this is pretty exciting, I think. Uh, we've actually released uh, an early version of that for computer vision problems through Google Cloud's uh, product suite so that people with computer vision problems but who don't have machine learning expertise can just put their images there and get a trained model for the particular problem they care about. Okay. Um, in the last little bit, I'd like to talk about how deep learning is transforming how we design computers. So, um, the machine learning models that I've described here all have two special properties. First is that reduced precision is fine. A single digit of precision is totally great. You don't need five or six digits of precision. And the other property is that all the operations are made up with a handful of very specific kinds of operations. Things like matrix multiplies or vector dot products. Um, so essentially, if you can make a processor that does only reduced precision linear algebra, but does it really fast, you're going to be in uh, a pretty happy state for machine learning model. And so we've actually been working in this space for a while. We rolled out uh, this first thing, uh, which is a tensor processing unit. Uh, we designed this first one only for inference. Um, but this is now used every time you do a Google query for all of our translation work. Um, for you know many other kinds of things, for labeling all the images that go into Google Photos. Um, and it's very good at reduced precision uh, linear algebra, uh, and it's even lower precision because it's only for inference. So you're not changing the model, uh, you're just trying to use an existing model that you've already trained for new examples. The second generation system uh, is for training and inference. And this is what we call a cloud CPU, which is available now. We actually offer this as a, um, a sort of a infrastructure uh, service that people can get a virtual machine with one of these devices attached and use it for machine learning for their own problem. And if we zoom in to one of these, uh, one of these chips, you see the architecture is actually pretty simple. It's essentially a bunch of high bandwidth memory on the sides there and a really large multiplier unit. So you think of it as a uh, hardware structure that does make it multiply in single cycles. And then some other scalar and vector units for some of the other stuff. Um, and these are designed to be connected together into larger configurations. Uh, in particular, uh, what we call pods, CPU version 2 pods, 64 of those boards wired together, which is 11 and a half petaflops of compute, which is a fair amount. 
Um, and then uh, just yesterday at Google I.O., where I was uh, the fire rock this morning, um, the, we announced the third version of this. So basically every year in the last three years, we've announced a new version of these. This new version is liquid cooled because it runs a little warm. Uh, and so you can see the, the cooling pipes there. And it's also designed to be connected into a large pod configuration uh, that are uh, quite a bit bigger than the earlier pods. So it's about 8x the performance of the pod we announced last year, and it's more than 100 petaflops. Uh, and for comparison, you know, this is reduced precision, so it's not entirely comparable, but the top supercomputer in the world is about 125 petaflops. Um, and that, that's double precision arithmetic. This is sort of lower precision than that. But still, if you want to do machine learning, this is a pretty good machine. Um, and normally, programming a supercomputer is kind of annoying, but we've designed these to be programmed via TensorFlow, so you can express your machine learning model and then run it on a CPU, a GPU, or on the CPU. Um, and it scales from those single boards to full pods in some cases. Uh, I think I'm going to skip that. Uh, one of the things they've been doing is putting together reference models for these devices so that they're regularly tested as for accuracy and performance. And then when people have a problem that is like a computer vision problem or a language modeling problem or a translation problem, they can just point it at their data and train that model. Uh, I think I will skip this. I will tell you, so ResNet 50 is a popular ImageNet training uh, model. Uh, and so one of the nice things is you can train to 76% accuracy in about 785 minutes. Uh, 24 and a half minutes on half a pod, 12.2 minutes on a full pod. And if you're doing that on a full pod, you're going through the entire ImageNet training data set every eight seconds. And it takes about 90 or 70 epochs, and 70 passes over the data to converge. Just four or five years ago, that took about six weeks to train an ImageNet model. So, uh, and it scales pretty well. This is sort of ideal versus uh, observed speed up as we increase the number of devices. And the reason for that is the interconnect between these devices is quite fast. Um, the other thing we're doing is making a thousand of these devices available for free to researchers in both computer science and machine learning, but also other sciences who are committed to doing open research. So if you're willing to openly publish the work that you do, ideally open source code related to the work that you do, but that's not a requirement, uh, I'd encourage people to go there and, and sign up. We have a lot of these devices available. You can see them used for all kinds of things. Uh, I'm going to skip this, and uh, I will talk now, finally, about how did some of these ideas fit together. So, one of the problems I think we have is for most machine learning problems, we train a model to do a specific thing. And then, if we want to do a different thing, we train a different model to do that. And we gather training data for that particular uh, problem, and we gather different training data for a different problem. Um, and I think what we actually want to aspire to is models that do many, many, many things. Like, ideally, one model that does everything. And if we can do that, we're going to want this large model, but it's going to be sparsely activated because it's going to need kind of different centers of expertise for different kinds of problems. And it's going to want to use kind of the techniques that the AutoML system uses to learn what is the right structure for solving different problems. And so if you think about a problem, a, a model that could do that, it would look like this. It would have a bunch of input tasks and outputs for those tasks, and have pathways for those different tasks that it has developed through a learning process. And then when a new task comes along, you want to find the parts of the expertise you've already built up that are actually useful for solving this new task. So you might say, well, if I use this pathway for this new task, it gets me in a pretty good state. You know, I don't need that many examples, and I can already kind of figure out what's going on. And then if I want more accuracy for this task, I might add a new piece of the model that is specific to that task and extend my pathway a bit and end up with something that looks like that. So that's where I think we want to go. And we need a lot of computation to, to do that. We need the ability to train models on many, many tasks simultaneously and to really uh, then make use of these models to learn to do new things automatically. So, with that, I'm going to conclude, 
And first, I want to tell you, ML hardware is at its infancy. I think there's a lot of exciting stuff in computer architecture to specialize around these kinds of applications. And I hope I've convinced you that there's significant breakthroughs in many, many fields. Like, if you think back to those grand challenges, I believe many of them will be influenced by the things we can do with machine learning to, to affect them. And with that, I can take a couple of questions if we have time. Yep. First of all, thanks for, for the nice talk. And uh, one question I have, uh, since I'm a computer electronics engineer, what's the impact of uh, in uh, power uh, expenditure? If everybody's using machine learning types of algorithms all over the world, uh, I, I believe Google spends a lot of money in power generation and power controls and all this stuff. So what would be the impact to the world if everybody starts using machine learning stuff? I know the harder thing you have done uh, in part address the problem, but it doesn't solve it. Right. So um, I agree energy use of computation in general is becoming a more significant fraction. It's still a very tiny fraction of the energy consumed in the world, but it, it probably is growing. You know, the ML hardware we have here is much more power efficient. So we published a paper in the International Symposium on Computer Architecture about the first generation of that, where we showed it's about 30 to 50 times more energy efficient than GPUs or CPUs. Uh, I, uh, there's a reference to that on that on .co frame. Um, so that helps, but as you say, it may not be sufficient. Uh, we actually use only renewable energy to power all of our data centers. Uh, so we think that's the right thing to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I think um, the price of solar is dropping quite a lot, so I, I think we want more people to use machine learning because the benefits to the world are going to greatly outweigh the energy cost. Yes. Uh, well, great talk. Uh, how about the impact of uh, machine learning on uh, science discovery? So maybe in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we won't have, <laughs> won't be here because you just go around the billions of papers and maybe because there is a lot of information there that uh, is not put together, especially in the biomedical area. So right. how do you... So my view of this is actually computation and machine learning is actually a great tool for generating hypotheses that then require human ingenuity to figure out what is the right experiment to run to go test those hypotheses. And so I actually think we'll be able to accelerate science by having machine learning work in collaboration with human scientists. And I think that's true of many of the things. If you imagine back to the, the quantum chemistry problem, if your tool is 300,000 times faster, you can actually explore many more kinds of ideas. Hi. I'm in here from you. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Yeah. What are the, the hot topics for machine learning to deal with right now? The hot topics. Hot, hot topics to, to tackle yep. in general. Yeah. So I didn't, really, I, I didn't really talk about it in my talk, but, um, you know, I think there's a variety of, of problems around the set of areas of how do we actually deploy learned systems in a safe manner uh, instead of sort of more traditional hand-coded systems. I think for safety critical systems that are hand coded, we've developed a lot of software engineering tools and expertise in how do you make a you know an aircraft control system safe. As we start to have more learned systems, I think safety uh, processes for learning algorithms are going to be a, a are, are a hot topic and are going to become more and more important as we start to make more safety critical decisions than just you know mislabeling your pet as a you know, a chihuahua instead of a German Shepherd. Um, I think that's one. I think as machine learning gets used through society more, many of these algorithms can perpetuate biases that exist in the data that we would train on. I think that's, that's another uh, important hot topic that uh, is getting a lot of attention and is not solved, but has some good ideas in there. Um, and then I think hot topics of how do you 
do meta learning, this sort of learn to learn thing. Because I think the only way we're going to get to much more intelligent systems is if you don't need a human in the loop for every new problem you want to solve, right? I look at you to use them some powder. I would have to know. Uh, so it depends quite a lot on the nature of the work. M many of our papers that we publish, we published uh, about 150 papers last year. I would say probably 30 or 40 percent of them have non-Google authors on the paper. Uh, so, for example, the medical work we collaborated with people at UCSF and Stanford and University of Chicago. Uh, the quantum chemistry work had collaborators in a, a Swiss university and uh, Stanford, I believe. Um, so there's definitely a lot of collaboration, and we generally also publish our work pretty openly, even if it is solely done by Google by Google authors, uh, so that other people can take advantage of our work and build on it. Um, I'm uh, in, I'm in medical sciences at the academy, and as a physician, we're very conservative. You know, the first rule is primonosity, first do no harm, right? Yes. So now suppose you have a patient, and the physician has no idea what the patient has, but you have an algorithm, uh, one of these machine learning algorithms, which is actually a black box. You don't know uh, the layers are inside. So you have an input and an output, and the output say, do open heart surgery immediately. Uh, and the physician really doesn't understand what's going on. So. For the future, will medicine change or will computer science change? Ah, so you're bringing up the problem of interpretability of these models, and that is a criticism of them. But we've actually made great strides in that and actually have models that are pretty interpretable for many of the kinds of problems we care about, in particular the one you brought up. I usually use patient needs heart valve replacement, but I like open heart surgery because it's even more extreme. Um, so. Um, in the paper that I that I showed, we actually show that we're we're able using a technique called attention, which it sort of says you consume the input data, the medical record, and then you make a prediction. This mechanism called attention allows us to say when we're making a prediction, what parts of the medical record are we paying attention to? And you can actually say something like patient needs a heart valve replacement or open heart surgery because this phrase in a medical note from two years ago, this test result, which is a bit high, and these three things here. So I think we do want kind of this machine doctor collaboration where they collaborate to try to understand what's going on with the patient. We actually have models that can give you that level of, of interpretability. So, but it is a big problem. We don't want the black box saying do heart surgery now. Okay. Well, uh, we could stay here all the afternoon <laughs> asking questions, but we, we have a schedule to follow. I'd like to thank Jeff very much for this great talk. I think that he opened a lot of... Thank you very much.